Aren't you sitting in this courtyard? Why are you sitting in? Yeah, so I have to we'll go ahead and get rolling today. Uh, so thank you all for coming out, especially uh, as things look like they, they might take a turn for, uh, for, for the worse with the weather. Uh, might get some, some snow and ice, which we know in Logan, <coughs> South Carolina is, you know, yeah, if it happens, it's it's uh, like a, an apocalyptic event. So down yes. here, I lived in Albany, New York. For oh, five so years. you know so, Yeah, I, I know all about snow and ice, but down here we don't know all about snow and ice, so we kind of lose our minds. Um, but hopefully, we'll make it through that. Uh, and we're we're grateful for y'all for for coming out ahead of that, and uh, especially uh, grateful uh, for our our poets and. Uh, our first poet, Elizabeth Robin, for being here uh, in person and, and coming up from further down on the coast, uh, from Hilton Head Island, to be with us. And this is our, our uh, 16th annual uh, Litchfield Tea and Poetry Series uh, here at the Waccamaw Library. Uh, it's sponsored by our friends at the Waccamaw Library, or FAL, uh, and they're you know, wonderful supporters. If you're not a member of our friends, we uh, encourage you to join up. Uh, we have uh, a member right back there to so you can to make it very easy and pleasant for you to do so. But they they make this event possible. They fund it uh, and so many other events uh, here, not just adult programs but uh, uh, teen programs, children's programs. So uh, please think about joining our friends. They're they're very friendly to us here at the library. Uh, so we appreciate that. We appreciate. Uh, our tech specialist, Truman Wins, for being here. He's going to uh, help uh, smooth out wrinkles and, and make it possible for our, our other poet, Ashley M. Jones, to join us virtual, virtually uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, so we appreciate him being here. And also Aaron Brickle, our uh, cameraman, our videographer back there, who will uh, record this and uh, make it possible for lots of folks to see it online afterwards and enjoy uh, this great poetry that we're going to hear. So we, we appreciate his presence as well. Um, and this is a very long-standing series, 16th year and going strong, and we're really proud to feature these two poets to kick it off uh, this season. Okay. Okay. Hey. Hello, Ashley. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, let me allow me to introduce you, Ashley M. Jones. Well, we're thrilled to have you along with Elizabeth Robin uh, for our 16th annual Tea and Poetry to kick it off this series. Uh, an emerging voice of the current South, Ashley M. Jones is author of Magic City Gospel from Hub City in 2017. Dark slash slash thing, Pleiades from 2019, and Reparations Now from Hub City 2021. She has earned several awards, including the Roman Jaff Foundation Writers Award, the Silver Medal in the Independent Publishers Book Award, and the Lucille Clifton Poetry Prize. Her work appears in or is forthcoming at CNN Poetry, the Oxford American, and Obsidian, among other venues. Jones teaches in the low residency MFA program at Converse College up in the upstate, and she recently served as guest editor for Poetry Magazine. Uh, she's also, once I wrote this bio, uh, she's added you know, at least a couple of other uh, feathers into her very uh, full cap. Uh, she is uh, the current poet laureate of Alabama and its first black poet laureate. Uh, so there's a big, big award already, and uh, Reparations Now is long listed for the 2020 Penn uh, Volcker Award for Poetry. So Ashley just keeps going and going and going, uh, keeps it rolling, and we're so, so glad that you could join us uh, here today uh, on the big screen. Uh, Ashley, uh, thanks so much for being with us.
Thanks for having me. You said I'm on a big screen. That's scary to hear. <laughs> but it's nice to be here. I imagine I can just go right into it, Daniel. Yes. Yes. Go, go, go right, right ahead. Okay. Perfect. Well, um, thanks again for inviting me, and it's great to see everybody there virtually. I'm coming in from Birmingham, Alabama, um, where it is coldish. I imagine it's coldish where you are too. Um, but glad we can be inside and um, listening to poetry this morning. So I brought um, a total of eight poems to read, um, and I also brought, per Daniel's instructions, a poem by someone else who inspires me. So I wanted to start with that poem, um, and it's called Why Some People Be Mad at Me Sometimes by Lucille Clifton. Um, so just a little story about this poem, and you can hear Clifton actually telling the story if you look up the recording online. She was, for a time, poet laureate of the state of Maryland. And um, soon into her tenure, Maryland celebrated some anniversary of its um, founding. And the theme was our happy colonial days. And they asked Lucille Clifton, who was a black woman, um, to write a poem about our happy colonial days. And you can imagine that didn't really make any sense to her. So she said she wrote a poem for the event. She managed to get something together. But she wrote this poem for herself. And I think it exemplifies what I try to do in my poetry and what I advise others to do, which is to stay very true to your authentic self and stay very, stay very close always to the truth. Why some people be mad at me sometimes. They ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories. And I keep on remembering mine. Okay. Am I coming through clear? I feel like I'm hearing echo, but I think it's probably just because I'm in the room and in this room. So. Um, You're perfect. All right, so I wanted to start with a poem um, on that theme of sticking, sticking very closely to um, the truth and to my authentic self. This poem is about Sally Hemings, who we know to have been enslaved by Thomas Jefferson. Some people in the past call her his mistress, his lover, um, but those titles simply cannot be true because she was, in fact, um, his slave, so she was property, therefore she did not have the ability to give consent to be in that relationship. So I wanted to write a poem uh, that sort of talked about just, you know, a little side note in Jefferson's story. What it means to say Sally Hemings. Bright girl, Sally. Mulatto, Sally. Well-dressed, Sally. Sally with, with the pretty, pretty hair. hair. Sally, Sally with the Irish cotton dress. Sally with the smallpox vaccine. Sally smelling of clean white soap. Sally never farmed a day in her life. Available Sally. Nursemaid Sally. Sally filled with milk. Sally going to Paris with master's daughter. Sally in the chamber with the president. Sally in the chamber with the president's brother. Illiterate Sally. Capable Sally. Unmarried Sally. Sally, mother of Madison, Harriet, Beverly, and Easton. Sally, mother of Easton, changed his name. Sally, mother of Easton, and him is Jefferson. Easton, who made cabinets. Easton, who made music. Easton, who moved to Wisconsin. Easton, whose children were Jefferson's. Ethan, who died of a white man. Grandmother Sally of the white Hemingses. Infamous Sally. Silent Sally. Sally kept at Monticello until Jefferson's death. Sally, whose children were freed without her. So I want to move to another poem. And I should have said, these first, first two are from my Magic Gospel, which is my first book. My first born, born I say, I don't have my children, children my own yet, yet, but my first, first born, born book. book. Um, and, and this poem is one, one that I wrote um, sort of imagining a world in which black people, black people um, are at the center instead of at the bottom. And, and it's, it's called, called Poem for Revolution, 
for Malcolm, Martin, Martin, Martin and, and all the rest. rest. The boys and the girls are black. The dolls and the trucks are black. The mama and the daddy are black. The road and the sky are black. The Bibles and the bullets are black. The father and the son are black. The water and the fountain are black. The fire and the hoses are black. The shoes are black, the mouths are black, the singers and the songs black, the caskets and the weepers are black, the chaff and the wheat are black, the wind rolls blackly through the fields. So I'm going to move now to my second book, which is called Dark Thing. And um, I'm still keeping on the theme of what's authentic to me and uh, keeping very close to the truth. And so this poem um, is about Frederick Douglass on Hester. If you've ever read his autobiography, there's a passage, and I'll read a little bit from it, where he talks about um, hearing his on Hester being whipped by the master. Uh, because she refused the master's advances. She did not want to engage in a sexual relationship with him. Uh, and so this screen is something that you know, sort of haunted Frederick Douglass over his whole life. And so I wanted to write a poem that kind of went deeper into that screen um, and what it might have contained. So I'll read the title of the poem and then the epigraph uh, from Frederick Douglass. What is out of Aunt Hester's screen? I have often been awakened, awakened at the dawn, dawn of day by the most heart-rending shrieks of an old aunt of mine, whom the masters used to tie up to joints and whip upon her naked back until she was literally covered with blood. blood. Frederick Douglass, near to the life of Frederick Douglass, Douglass and her hair slave. What flew out of Aunt Hester's screen? Her, her pretty face. face. The dawn, the, the men who ate it whole, summer, summer the plantation, plantation grass, fear, a, a golden, golden sight, the, the cotton, cotton bleeding pink, pink. The, the way a dress unfolds to a whip, to a man's hands, hands which, which are whips, whips. Blood, 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 Jesus, Mary, Mary Joseph. Joseph. Her body, her body, desire, her, her body, body, a slave, light. light. Okay, okay, we are halfway, halfway through. If, if you've been, been counting down, down we're, we're at four. four. Um, um, and, and this poem is one, um, although the subject doesn't necessarily have to kind of make a smile because, because it was uh, one of my dad's favorite poems of mine. Um, um, I lost my dad last year. Last year um, um, very unexpectedly, so, so I try to find it in every corner of every place, place now. now. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to read this poem today. Think, think about him. Um, um, the poem itself, itself I wrote um, in, a in a moment of frustration, frustration thinking, thinking about um, the election, election that was coming up that year in 2016, and then thinking back to even the founding documents of our country and how even within those texts, my people not accounted for. So this, so this is called Election, election Year 2016, 2016 the, motto. the Motto. We, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. We hold the truth, men are created equal, that is self-evident. We, true men, are self-evidently created equal. We hold, we hold these truths, truths that, that men have created, created it's self-evidently not equal. We who are not truth cannot be equal. Our race too self-evident. We held on for a truce between the self and its need for equality. Victory is not self-evident. We hold these truths. What, what more can the self hold? What, what evidence, evidence is there that we are equal? We held the truth, not guns, to be self-evident. But bullets and words are not equal. 
we held our lives like the truth. truth. But, but death, death was even, even truer. truer. It's a certainty, certainty self-evident. Self So I'm going to move to my most recent book reparation now, these last few poems. Um, and I have to say, this book has really blown away from me. I mean, it's, it's doing a lot of things uh, that I did not know I should do. And I'm just excited to see where else this book will take me. So I'm going to start with a poem um, that tells the story of um, West West expansion, expansion, we'll say it that way. Manifest, Manifest destiny. destiny. And, and so he learned, learned that the land could be called a name. name. So, so he, he called, called it mine. And, and so, so he learned it could, it could be bordered with blood. blood. And, so and so he called, he called it conquest. conquest. And, and he learned that the land was willing to give fruit and then flower. flower. And he, and he called, called it prophet. prophet. And, and so, so he saw some other folk planting, planting and grazing, and, and he called them enemy. enemy. And so he and saw, saw there were armies, there were armies to, guard to guard those flowering, flowering folk, and he and called, called them prey. And, and, and so he saw the ocean, ocean. And, and what was it but a highway to make more borders? And so he saw the bright and peaceful sea and he littered it with, with trade. trade. The, the bodies, bodies stacked next, next to the crops, the textiles, the rot, the, the disease. And, and so, so he ground hope, hope and God into dust, dust and, and called it rice. rice. And, and so, so he heard the wind, wind blowing blow joy over its people, people. And, he and he sliced it up with law. And, and so, so he kept slicing for 500 years. And so he built his things around him. And, and so, so his, his coffers never, never emptied. emptied. And so, and so he took wives and made children. children. And, and so, so he gave them to a price. price. And, and so, so he saw each blade, blade of grass and, and counted, counted it as, as currency. currency. And, and so, so his blood was transfused with gold. gold. And, and so, so he built a wall around himself to keep his many riches in. The, the walls encased with bone. bone. Even, Even his, his heart, heart a, fortress a fortress of muscle and money. Listen, Listen now, your past and future generations. Your mortal fall will spoil where, where you stand. stand. So, so I'm just, just going to end. I'm going to skip a couple because I'm going to keep the right, the right time. time. Uh, I'm, I'm going to end with a poem. That, that I um, that, that I call, call one of my greatest hits now, um, <laughs> and the reason, and the reason I, call I call it that is because I seem like wherever, wherever I go, I end up reading this poem, this poem or, people or people will ask me to so, it, so I, I, I feel like, like I should just keep it going, going keep reading it. it. Um, and, and, and this poem, poem interestingly, I, I, I thought it was going to be really exciting just because I got it published in exciting place. It was on Poem Day last year, which was really awesome. But there was another exciting place, poem. Lit, Lit, which was on Good Morning America, America last year. year. I, I had the fortune to go on there and, and actually like to read a poem, poem so this poem makes me excited, excited for all those reasons. And, and um, this poem is a song, and, and it, it responds, responds to this, this lifelong frustration I've had as an Alabamian with people, people thinking, thinking that um, my state, state and any state, state below the Mason line, line is to blame for every bad thing, thing and, and that, that this is the only place in our country where we have any problems, problems at all, which we, we know is not true. true. That's definitely true. true. Whatever is wrong in one state is reflected in every state. state. We are, in fact, the United States of America. America. So if so there's a problem in Alabama, that problem exists everywhere. So this poem is called All Y'all Are Literally From Alabama. Which is, Which is also, also sort of a little joke, joke because everywhere, everywhere I go, go somebody has to mention Alabama. Alabama. I feel like, like everything started, started here <laughs> in, some in some way. way. And, and it begins with a quote from Dr. King. King. The, the straight jackets of race, race prejudice, prejudice and, and discrimination do not wear only Southern labels. labels. The subtle the psychological technique of the North has approached in its ugliness and victimization of the Negro, the outright terror of the brutality of the South. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., why, why we can't, can't wait. wait. 
This, this year, year, the cradle of, of this year nation. nation. Everywhere you look, roots run right back south. Everything filled with red dirt, blood, cotton. We, we the dirty, dirty words have been out of your mouth. Mason, Mason Dixon, Dixon is an imagined line. line. You can, you can theorize, theorize it or wish it real, real, but it's, but it's the, same the same old ghost. ghost. See through, benign. benign. All oh, y'all from Alabama. Alabama. We, we the wheel turn high to, to make the nation, nation move. We the scapegoat in a land built, built from, from death. death. No, no lunch or latitude to disprove the truth of founding fathers' sacred oath. We, we hold, hold these truths like dark, dark snuff in, in our jaw. jaw. Black, Black oppression is not, not happenstance, happenstance. It it's is law. law. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Thank you, Thank you so, so much, much Ashley. Ashley. And, um, would, would, could, would you mind, would you mind taking a few questions? questions? All right. Sure. Yeah. Does uh, any, any folks, folks out, out there have a question, question or, or comments for Ashley? Ashley, you mentioned that you teach. Can we talk a little bit about your teaching? Yeah, yeah so, I teach. Um, my first job, I think I worked too many jobs, honestly, but my main job is um, at the Alabama Council School of Life Fine Art in Birmingham. And um, I actually attended that school to the seventh through twelfth grade students. We have six majors, and the major that I teach is creative writing, so I'm able to teach young people um, poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. I also, as I mentioned, teach in the lower residency in my favorite program at Converse. Um, I, I just started there, so I guess I'm kind of getting used to um, that, that group. But, but yeah, yeah teaching has always been something that I love since I was a teenager, teenager actually, uh, teaching in summer camps. I just, I just really enjoy um, seeing students find their place and encouraging them as they uh, continue to use that place in whatever way they take, even if they don't become professional writers. The voice is something that we all need to find um, and and protect um, and support each other. So, uh, and, and I try, I try to teach, teach about history as well, even though I'm talking, talking about, about poems, poems and how to write them, them and how to use meter, meter and how to use rhyme, and all these things. I try, I try to make sure the poem has proper context. context. So, so if, if we're, we're learning about um, um, Phyllis Wheatley, we're, we're not just reading her poems and understanding what forms she used. Use. We're talking we're about the his historical context. context. We're, talking we're talking about how she, she um, proved some people, people wrong, wrong as an enslaved person being right, being right, right you know, you know, at such a high level. Um, so, um, that's, so that's hopefully that's an answer to the question about teaching. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, absolutely. As a newly named poet laureate, what do you plan to do in that holy pulpit? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, so, so I have some ideas, ideas and I hope that they can come to fruition. Um, but um, my, my main goal is to get, to get resources, resources into the state, state of Alabama, Alabama for, for all of the different organizers who are already really working, working to make, make poetry, poetry program happen here. Um, in the, in the, the South, South, as you all you know, know, it's not it's always, always easy to get funding. funding. Um, um, sustained funding, funding you know, yeah, as well. As well. Um, so, um, so I'm planning to apply for a fellowship from the Academy of American Poets so that I can establish what I'm thinking I'm going to call a poetry delegation. I'll have different delegates across the state who can address the needs of their area. And we, and can, we can give, give that funding out, out to people, to, people to, to put on readings, readings to do workshops, workshops whatever, whatever it is they need to do. In addition, in addition I'm already I'm starting, starting to um, book some uh, workshops with different organizations. I definitely, I definitely want to visit a lot of schools. schools. I'm, I'm already doing a lot of that. that. Um, so I'm going to keep doing that and add some more. And I'm hoping to also engage all age groups. I already work a lot with Adolescents, adolescents and young adults, young adults um, uh, but I want to expand, expand into younger young children, children and senior, and senior citizens, citizens as well. well. So we'll see how it goes over the next four years. years. But, but I'm hoping, hoping that I can just inspire, inspire everyone, everyone to, to try poetry. Um, um, I really, I really do, do think everybody, everybody can benefit from, from reading, reading, writing, writing a, poem, a poem, even if you don't become you know, the next, the next I don't know, Joy Harjo, you know, I think it still can be helpful. So those are the plans so far that I have. 
Thank you. Ashley, uh, do, you do you ever, you seem, this seems, seems like a, a, a ridiculous question for you, for you but do you ever suffer from writer's block? block? I mean, oh, so, oh, okay. <laughs> how do you, how do, do you have strategies, strategies to work out of that? that? How do you deal with that? Yes. yes. Um, so, so it's funny, it's funny. I, I am in, in a stage of that right, right now. now. Um, you know, you know, and I, I do, I do tell, tell students this too, too even though they have deadlines, deadlines. You, know, you, don't, don't, you don't need to force, force yourself. yourself. If, if it's really not really happening for you, you that's made for a reason. reason. You know, maybe like, like, you haven't had a thought of what it is you need to say. So for me, I tell myself that too. If I'm in a moment where I'm not thinking of anything or I don't feel full to write, then I just don't do it. I give myself a break. Because I do think that's important. It's not that I stop thinking in poems, in poems it's, just, it's just that it's not, not time, time to get to, get to, get to the page. page. So, so like, like I said recently, recently I've kind of gone through, through it. it. I mean, we're, I mean, we're all, all going through something, something right now. Right? <laughs> clearly, clearly. Um, but, but I have, I have had a few deadlines that I have to like, get myself in the right mindset for. And, and really, really what I've done, done every time is kind of wait. Even if I know my deadline is like tomorrow, okay, it's going to come. I know what the deadline is. Something is going to speak to me. And every time, if I just give it space, Something, something will happen. Will happen. Um, and if and I really have to really force, force it, you know, you know like, like that doesn't that work, work, I'll listen, I'll listen to music, music that gives me a particular mindset, mindset, or I'll or talk, I'll talk out with someone, someone using mom, um, um, she'll, she'll help, help me figure out the idea. idea. Um, but, yeah, but yeah, otherwise, otherwise you just gotta, gotta wait through it, you know, which is uncomfortable, but life is uncomfortable. We know you have to, Buzzway, and you got to go, go go teach, teach and so some more, more good, good work. work. But, but thank you for doing this uh, this wonderful uh, job today and being with us and reading those uh, those beautiful, inspiring poems. Uh, and, and so and doing all the great work that you you're doing out there. So you're you're keeping busy and and, uh, and keeping us busy with all that you're you're doing. And we although you're a, you're a very good thing that started in Alabama. But, but you're spreading, spreading around, and uh, you are. We, we claim you uh, for, for South Carolina, Carolina as well, because you are you are right. part of the college, <laughs> and uh, you know you're, you're part, part of the series, series in South Carolina. So uh, we'll, we'll claim, claim you as one of our own to uh, to get in on, on, on a going, going concern. concern. But we, we, we would really appreciate you being here with us uh, today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Take, Take care. good care. All right. Okay, and do you want me to just get the chair? Get in the, get in the chairs now. Yeah, so, I'm so sorry about the, uh, the glitch there, but um, yeah, this is this is uh, Elizabeth Robin, and we're thrilled to have her. And she is, uh, although where are you from originally? Uh, I was a meanie brat. Okay. I don't know how to answer that question. I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> but you are. You. I always say Virginia if I need to say something okay. because I was there. You, you moved around, but you, yeah. you kind of settled down in South Carolina. So we can we can definitely claim you. And you did. You know, I'm on the the, the board of uh, the, the South Carolina Academy of Authors. So yeah. very particularly proud of, of that award that you you're. Uh, you're doing great. I've actually lived state. here now. This is the second longest I've lived anywhere in this state. Yeah, so, so this is this yeah. is a, a home for you, yeah. for sure. And we're happy to have you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I also uh, want to start with the poem that I brought, written by someone else. Um, I decided to read six poems of mine that fall into uh, are under a theme of dreams, those things that haunt you, the ghosts that we have rattling around in our heads, um, because that's the theme of my new book, To My Dreamcatcher. Um, many of those poems I wrote when I was on this epic journey in 2018, where I went like over 19,000 miles, just me and my dog. And before I left, a friend of mine gave me this poem to take with me, and I read it every night. Um, it's by Mary Oliver, uh, and it, I think 
makes sense in terms of why she gave me this poem. Sleeping in the forest. I thought the earth remembered me. She took me back so tenderly, arranging her dark skirts, her pockets, full of lichens and seeds. I slept as never before, a stone on the riverbed, nothing between me and the white fire of the stars, but my thoughts, and they floated. Light as moss among the branches of the perfect trees, all night I heard the small kingdoms breathing, around me the insects and the birds who did their work in the darkness. All night I rose and fell as if in water, grappling with a luminous doom. By morning, I had vanished at least a dozen times into something better. Yeah, Mary Oliver rocks, doesn't she? Yeah. So this first one I'm going to read. Um, it's going to be into my dream catcher. But to give you an idea of what kind of piece this is, it's a little bit long, and it was first published this summer in Drunk Monkeys. I think if I had a therapist, you could make a lot out of this. It's one of the things that I do, tip to writers, I, I keep a journal. I keep it by my bed because I'm a very vivid dreamer, and I often find myself uh, waking up remembering a dream, and if I don't write it down right then, most of it goes, wherever those go. Um, so these are, some of them are actual dreams I had, and then some of them become something I conjured in my imagination. And I call it runaway dreams. I've been talking to ghosts most of my life. Sometimes they tell me things I don't understand, like, do you know a Venus day is longer than a Venus year? I hear this and just feel confused. What is real? What imagined? How do I know what is true? When to stay? Again, like last night and the night before, I am flying low, a few feet above the treetops, hovering like a helicopter, but in a soaring swoop, the hawk zigzagging in search of prey. And like last night and the night before, I spy my mother far below, distant, pointing up, calling to me, not angry, but pleading. And like last night and the night before, I pause, a dragonfly that flits above the water, the hummingbird that pauses to sip nectar. And I laugh and laugh. No one can reach me. I dreamt about Ben again tonight. Same scene, same outcome. I've gone to the movies alone as always, sat on the aisle back right, except I've moved one seat in as though I expect him. And just after the previews, a man slips into the seat. He says nothing, or rather, he simply leans into my ear, whispers, I'm here, ever so lightly, kisses the crescent above my earring, nuzzles into my hair. It's electric, the contact. He begins a circle of soft kisses across my cheeks and forehead, weaves his hand into my hair, pulls me, pulls me, and then we're lip to lip tasting and I'm kissing back like I'm starving. At some point, he pulls me into his chair between his legs, my back pressed to his chest, and he folds his arms around me. We are pressed together, he kissing my neck or rubbing my ear between whispers. You're so beautiful. I've wanted to do this for so long. Stay with me over and over and over. I've closed my eyes so I can feel everything. We don't see the movie, but when the credits roll, I get up and walk, up the aisle, through the lobby, out the door. I get into my car, pull out, and don't look back. 
in the shadow I cast on the pavement, I am slim and long and curved like a statue. Venus, the neighborhood goddess. Shadows hide, knobby veins, the road map of creases, the riverbed crinkling out like the Mississippi Delta around my eyes. The mirror sends back an altered image, but in the dim light, vibrant, rosy-cheeked, and brimming. I fade into a box of mirror and shadow, amorphous forms, stare back. I land in the middle of a Bruce Springsteen party, the center of attention. Patty peppers me with questions. What's your story? How do you know the boss? And orders, read us a poem until, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, feels suspicious. It seems I'm famous, so I bear my soul to strangers. I stumble in and seen, spectator at some kind of to the death boxing match, a meeting that erupts from zero to Mach 10, a brother's standoff. I wonder how this can be happening when one of them is two years dead. But here we are at some kind of family social, and he's kicking, scratching, punching, grappling, and then, yes, biting. I hear an unholy scream, high-pitched, emanate from the living brother, see a torn cheek, blood, the dead brother re-securing his prey in a tearing bite worthy of a lion ripping wildebeest flesh on the savanna. I stare, frozen in tableau, unable to process what I see, nor piece together how or why. But all at once, I hear a voice hysterical and understand the police are being called. All at once, my daughter materializes. We shout as one, stop, we need to get out, now. And through the fog of his rage, he must hear, for he savages one last shredding chomp to his brother's impotent screams and shoves him away. He pivots to follow us, sprinting our girl in the lead. She knows the way out. As if on a James Bond set, we fly through room after room, sealing each passage with airlocks like a submarine compartment. Whoosh. Reach a steel chamber. There's a swimming pool, luxurious bed, and back inside this vault. I can't understand where we are, but we are clearly trapped. Then our girl, so calm and steady, says, this is where dad and I stayed the last time we were here. I know the code. She slips out a steel spike, pushes it into newly exposed sockets, presses buttons in sequence, and waits as a domed aperture opens like a camera shutter's eye. We are well down the road before the police drive past us, heading for what we left. Conversation swirls around me. I sit in my camper and catch snippets. I try not to listen. The earnest father-son discussion of talents and futures, the vapid repartee of 20-somethings, the banal exchanges between the couple as they organize and prepare dinner, the squeals of children, words that float around me as ethereal as I must be to all these traveling packs my aloneness of palpable, breathing beast. It hangs like a bat, slung up a tree, a weight on limbs that frightens little girls. As well I should, I squeeze those who fill my past away. Jay dreams of a Viking funeral. His flaming boat sails to the Valkyries on a palm. I am a speck of dust. But each stripe on a Grand Canyon rock represents a year. Millennia of basalt and granite and sandstone tell a story. Eruptions, erosions, eras. I might, mighty river slices history, bare, sculptured, particles sparkle, afloat in the chasm's air.
Yeah, so hopefully there are no therapists listening to that. <laughs> I was thinking about that. Yeah. <laughs> How do you sleep at night? Is that true? Well, back then I really wasn't. That's part, no. of the, part of the reason I went on that camping trip. Yeah. <clears throat> I was kind of a mess in them days. So, um, Another thing I think humans tend to do is we look at things and for whatever reason our brain organizes it and we see it as something entirely different. <clears throat> and in Silk Purses and Lemonade, I have one where uh, this actually happened to me. I think the therapist might do something with this too, I don't know. <clears throat> uh, it first appeared in Autumn Sky Poetry Daily and it's in Silk Purses and Lemonade. A netherworld. From the frosted glass emerges a figure, slim, quixotic in posture, with a giant schlong ending at knees created by trickling drops. Fertility figures must quiver, cast sidelong glances from their appointed met displays. Labeled merely wood, igbo, masks, the clues that narrow place and tribe. Teak, mahogany, ebony, mango. Identity matters, she thinks, as water slides down the shallow wall, erasing her Bangwa king, the steamy replica her imagination conjures in a misty stall. The crude, oversized, exaggerated hope worries at her fevered mind. What next? Jesus in honeyed pancakes? Buddha in the laundry pile? <clears throat> um, this next will also be in To My Dreamcatcher, and it's first appearing in this anthology, Ripples. Um, it's an ekphrastic poem based on a piece of mosaic that Janet Kozacek did called Dreaming of Better Outfits. Um, but when I saw it, what came to mind for me was uh, the exhaustion that most women in the world must feel doing their daily job of trying to fetch and carry enough water for their family's use um, every day. It, gotta be tiring, and uh, part of the mosaic is a woman asleep with a bunch of pots and things around her. This is what I imagined. <clears throat> Dream Chambers. In her peasant dress, the cold tile floor pressing into her cheek, she sleeps among pots and vessels she carries to and from the spring to fill and balance atop her head for the miles home, back and forth, most of the day, until water fills the soup pot and cistern and wash tub. Her labors begin in the dark and end in the dark, neck and back, screaming as she floats in dream chambers, scene by scene. And a dream tick turns the clock back to a time of bustle, a neck to fl ankle flow of muslin, a cream hat windswept like a sloop sail, and a flirt of kinky, kicky booties. Upside down, she dreams in practicalities, a fruity tea dress, scoop neck comfort, a goddess in strappy gold sandals. The indigo wide brim drama tops a swishy swing dress, hips sway, thighs firm in knee-high suede, high heel boots. The pinstripe power suit clings her hour-shaped silhouette clear, sturdy stilettos stomp a corner office. Each compartment travels where she lives a put-together life, where water comes to her at the touch of her fingertips, sexy, powerful, a beauty to be watched and treasured. Next, and as Ashley put it, we're halfway there, three more. Um, 
I've been involved in a project this year called Uwili. Roughly, that's a Swahili word that translates to truth. Um, the project involves over 40 essayists and poets in South Carolina speaking to matters of South Carolina history as it, in terms of race relations. In this poem, everything that you hear is a matter of public record, um, but the voice is completely fictional. <clears throat> what Mama says, don't think I'm haunted, exactly, not haunted, no, but I can't get one picture out of my mind. Truth means seeing clear, and hear what I see. A mother shot, just watched her husband die. The bullet that wounded her killed the baby in her arms. Pieces of brains and blood stained in her shoulder. She looking back, see her man and baby burn, her house collapsing on him. Sky bright past midnight with their flames. And she turned, rushing her three, bleeding chillin, untended across the street, push them under bushes, where they crouch, untended by doctor or friend or food or drink for three days while she wonder where her other two children be. Mom say, truth will set you free, but I was feeling trapped inside this truth. Amongst 13 men charged, my great-grandfather, big and bold on that list, indicted, tried, and acquitted on all charges, including killing the postmaster and his baby, a father and his baby. So I ain't feeling free, just full of questions. Did my mama know this story? Did grandma? Of course, they must have known. Thinking Lake City history ripe in atonement. The year my granddaughter born, we voted in 2011 to build a science museum in Ron McNair's name. And the year her mama graduated high school, Town in 2003, placed a historical marker on the empty South Street Church to tell the story of Fraser and Julia Baker's lynching. And you know, since 1986, Ron McNair Boulevard crosses South Church Street honoring him. Why? Atonement, maybe. Late as 1955, that's the year I was born, the Greater St. James AME Church set on the site of that 1898 fire in Lynchon burned. I hear because their preacher talking civil rights. Tain a pretty history, but it iron. In 1950, Ron McNair born here, becomes valedictorian, MIT graduate, laser specialist, Renaissance man, challenger, astronaut, and the town's favorite black son. All them what saw the fire must have heard the shots. All them Christians, where was they? We got 61 churches in Lake City, 61. Congregations maybe gone blind? Why didn't they petition? For government pensions do get a christian charity ain't christian the lake city folk did it in 1898 and before and after and ain't nobody served justice remember the main but not fraser baker and the stain spreads don't it mom say the truth will set you free but if and we can't see it we won't never be free i still can't get that picture out of my head out of my dreams, haunts as sure as that shooting happened. Does a sign, a museum, a tome enough? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna end on a romantic note. <laughs> Pull this out of the, um, this will also be into my dream catcher, and I guess this would be uh, a, a nod to a more geriatric romance. <clears throat> Waking next to a cemetery. They watch beginnings across the sweetgrass ocean, pinked by the dawn, voluptuaries pinned to a four-poster rice bed, marshland stretching out the bedroom window with the tide. In live flesh and sweet pulse they call to the gods of sunrise and robin's song, resurrected in a boiling nest, hatching roiling seas, coiling mists. Without warning, 
The lighthouse on distant Morris Island winks. Does it suspect the morning so close might shudder its light or renew later in moon glow magic, wilder nights? A knee high web catches early raindrops and glitters the fresh dug grave. Um, I'd like to end with this one. It's the title poem for my second book, Where Green Meets Blue, um, and it's an homage to my late husband. <clears throat> Where after. He strokes my back the way he did just before he fold me in his warmth. Scalp tingling, I sit on the stump of a ponderosa pine, the sky as cerulean as the ocean we swam on our honeymoon. I hear the waves through the trees lapping some magic shore. I crouch, hunched and small under that blue. I sense his fingers flutter through my hair, smell that vanilla musk, wonder tree bark, his skin, and tears dampen dry tinder. The wind sways the treetops, not our island shore. A breeze touches me the way he did. I watch the pine tops and calm. Where green meets blue, I remember. He loved that view, stitched into the seam of this whereafter, memories seep through. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. That was, that was wonderful. Thank you. Just a, an incredible array of, of you know, different poems, different styles, and different voices, and just uh, and subjects. So, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot going on here. So that was, that was pretty amazing. An amazing journey there. Um, do you mind taking some questions? Not at all. Yeah. Right. Rather than get ungracefully out of the chair. <laughs> so tight. Yeah. Roman, I'd like to ask you about the trip that you took. I think you said it was 19,000 miles. 19,413 miles. <laughs> yes. Um, I think I, I, my goal was 34 national parks. I think I made it to 28. Um, yeah, that was a summer that, that California was burning as usual. So I had to skip Yosemite and a few other things. Um, but yeah, it was just me and my dog. And you mentioned that you, um, are, you have a journal and that you write in the journal. So I wonder if you might, if you could share, how did a trip like that affect you as a writer? Uh, well, I'm, I'm still learning this craft. I, I was not a poet. I still find it funny to call myself a poet, so I don't know, but I, I um, didn't really start writing poems until around 2012. And um, so by the time I took that trip, um, I had gotten going, and I actually my second book had just come out. Um, and I had found in, in the, that space of years up where I began to write that my inspiration often came through nature. Um, some, something in nature became a metaphor for me all the time. Uh, and I walk my dog miles and miles and miles and miles. So a lot of my poems start in my head when I'm walking him in nature. Um, you know, I live in a beautiful place. Um, and I'm very lucky that way. But every time I travel, you know, I, I absorb that landscape. So by the time I got to that trip, where I was completely, I was alone all the time. Um, and that's really interesting because you don't have anyone to talk to or share what's happening. So it, it, made, it made for a much more fertile time for me. Um, I've never written as many poems as, as arrived 
in that. I mean, half of To My Dreamcatcher is poems from that trip. Um, yeah. Because normally I write like a, I'm lucky if I write one or two poems in a month. It takes a long time. Um, and some have taken years. But that summer, you know, in that, I was in, a, I was in this little bed, I call it a bed in a box. And uh, yeah, there wasn't much else to do but, but think. You, uh, you retired from teaching. Um, what were you? What did you teach? Uh, most of the time, high school English. Also taught psychology. Okay. Also taught the gifted and talented program. A few years. Yeah. Um, some AP classes. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, you pretty much teach if you're in a, a public educator. You pretty much teach whatever they hand you. <laughs> I was, I mean, did you, do you find that, um, that teaching has that, did that help or hinder your, your creative impulses, would you say? Did that, does that contribute or? That's a great question. Um, because in, in many ways, I was always reading, I was always uh, teaching writing, I was always working on, um, uh, habits of mind with my students um, and always looking for fresh literature to, to bring to them and so you know I was I've always been immersed in in that kind of world and I I'm very nerdy about it I, I really love it but but I didn't write when I was teaching I wrote letters of recommendation I wrote curriculum I, I wrote for the superintendent's newsletter um, so, in a lot of ways, it, it was it was a kind of writing that, that helped me to learn to be more precise than I had been before I had those things. But it was also kind of hateful writing that felt like work. It was, yeah, <laughs> you know, you had to have a particular product, and it, it, it uh, was very finite. Uh, so I I used to think, um, I mean, I did work. At, in the summers, but usually my summer jobs were, well, first of all, I didn't have to grade papers and do, you know, prep classes, so I had time at home. Um, but I didn't, they usually weren't full-time jobs in the summer, so um, I thought that I'd be able to start writing then, but I never, never could. I just couldn't find the space in my head. So when I retired, the one thing I wanted to do was write, find out if I could do it find out if anyone would ever think my stuff was any good. Mm. Um, never, I was a nonfiction writer. Never expected to be here. That, that was just an odd left turn. So I know Robin quite well, and I know all her poems. Um, but this question somehow popped up into my head while I was listening to you. Yes. Do you believe life is a sequence of phases? And if you do, if you don't, do you think those phases are something that we will them or something that, you know, just come to you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's quite a question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, think, I think you have to embrace the life that you're handed. Mm -hmm. And you're forced into phases. You're forced into them. Um, uh, a lot of silk purses and lemonade deals with being forced into these things um, because of, of loss. Um, uh, I have no immediate family left. I lost my last my my brother in 2014, and uh, you you know so you, your ability to to pick up the phone and call the person you've been calling for 60 years when you need. That, that perfect advice from someone that really knows you, you, you don't get to have that anymore. So, okay, what's next? Um, and obviously, um, becoming a widow, I had to learn how to do that. It wasn't something I expected was going to happen to me, certainly not at 60. Um, 
And uh, as, I mean, I, I have uh, a whole life now that is wonderful and joyful that I did not have even six or seven years ago. And um, you can either choose to whine about that or you can choose to embrace it and go after it. So that, you, you mentioned my title. Um, you know, to make silk purses out of sow's ears, um, make lemonade out of lemons, that's what that title comes from. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a, yes, it is a purposeful choice to do that. Because as you know, I can be prone to depression. <laughs> and, you, you know, you choose. I, I'm not going to do that. I've got to, i got to figure this out. And that's why I went camping. Where I figured it out. Yeah. Sort of. I'm not saying I figured much out. <laughs> well, and, and you're making, you know, out of difficult situations, you're making poetry, you know, taking mm -hmm. and making um, something pleasurable and sometimes joyful, funny, and uh, but redeeming out of that. Mm -hmm. So you and, and amazing that. It, it, that it really just started in 2012 and it's just, you know, just blossomed that fully. Shocker. Yeah, it's been <laughs> incredible. So, um, so keep it going. Uh, that's wonderful. And, you know, Mino is a, a poet as well. And so this is, you know, from, from right down in that area. Yeah, Mino so. and I have been together from kind of the beginning of this. And we're neighbors too. Yeah. And neighbors. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's um, a good. Uh, oh, it's. It's been, I mean, yes. as you know, she's a very talented person, yes. and uh, she knows more than I will ever know oh, about poetry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yes, yeah. it's been huge having her as a companion for that journey. So, and, and, well, thank you so much uh, to uh, Elizabeth Robin, and we're thrilled to, to have her. Thank you. Thank you. For helping uh, with Ashley Jones kick kick off the 16th uh, annual Team Poetry Series, and we will thanks to uh, Truman and Aaron, we'll have this uh, uploaded this video version uploaded to our Georgetown County Library uh, YouTube channel uh, in in a few days, so that we can share this uh, worldwide uh, potentially, so lots of others can share uh, in this this wonderful moment. So we we very much appreciate it. And we look forward to that and to the other sessions going forward and maybe inspiring some other folks to, to pick up uh, poetry reading, but also maybe uh, pick up uh, writing poetry as well, because uh, it certainly worked out uh, uh, for Elizabeth. Um, so thank you again, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.